And I'm gonna thank God for old time religion And I'm gonna thank God for giving me a vision One day I'm gonna join the heavenly choir And I'm gonna sing and never get tired And then I'm gonna sing somewhere around God altar And I'm gonna shout Moreover, we do have divination in the Yahweh cult itself, but this was performed by priests. They consulted some sort of divinely designated oracular object or objects. We call these the Urim and the Tumim, which should be familiar to all of you here at Yale. But Urim and Tumim are usually untranslated in your text because actually we don't really know what they mean. They might be related to the word for light, which is or, and the, the word for integrity, perhaps, or perfection, which is tom. So it might be. It's probably something like abracadabra, a little bit of a nonsense syllable that plays on words that did have meaning. We don't really know what the Orem and Tumim were, but they are said to be assigned by God. We think they, they may have been colored stones that were manipulated in some way by the priest to give a yes or a no determination to a question. But these are said to be assigned by God as a means that he himself authorizes for divining his will. And so the Deuteronomist accepts, accepts these. But in general, it's the view of the Deuteronomistic historian that divination, sorcery, and the like are not only prohibited, they're quite distinct from the activity of prophets. That's not what the prophets were about, according to the Deuteronomistic representation. The Hebrew prophet wasn't primarily a fortune teller. And I think this is a very common misconception. The Navi, the prophet, was addressing a very specific historical situation and was addressing it in very concrete terms. He was revealing God's immediate intentions as a response to the present circumstances. And the purpose of doing this was to inspire the people to change, to, to come back to faithful observance of the covenant. Any predictions that the prophet might make had reference to the immediate future as a response to the present situation. So in reality, the prophet's message was a message about the present. What is wrong now? What has to be done to avert the impending doom or to, to avert a future calamity? There were some women prophets in Israel. None of them are found among the literary prophets. That is to say, none of those books bearing the names of the prophets who uttered the oracles in them are named for women. So we have no women among the literary prophets, but you do have prophetic or prophesying women. Besides Miriam in the Pentateuch, there's also Deborah, who was a tribal leader and a prophet, featured in Judges 4 and 5. I mentioned Hulda. Her advice is sought during the, the reign of King Josiah. And you also have Noadia. Noadia prophesied in the post-exilic period. So this doesn't seem to be limited to, to males. Prophecy and kingship are closely connected in ancient Israel, and this is going to be very important. You'll recall, first of all, that the king is the anointed one of Yahweh, and it's the prophet who's doing the anointing. And that makes the connection between kingship and prophecy quite strong. If you think about Israel's first two kings, you also see a strong link with the phenomenon of prophecy. The first king, Saul, who was anointed by the prophet Samuel, is in addition said to have prophesied himself in the manner of the ecstatic prophets. When he is anointed king, he's then seized by the spirit of Yahweh. He joins a band of men. This is in 1 Samuel 10, verse 5. They're playing harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre. And he, he joins them, and this induces a, an ecstatic frenzy, a religious frenzy, that transforms him into another man, according to the text. And on another occasion, during his ecstatic prophesying, Saul strips himself naked. We have other accounts in the Bible of ecstatic prophets who would engage in self-laceration. David, the second king, is also said to prophesy himself. He also receives Yahweh's spirit or charisma from time to time, in addition to being anointed by a prophet. Subsequent monarchs aren't said to prophesy themselves, so that ends really with David. It's only Saul and David who are among the prophets. But even so, those subsequent prophets do not, the, uh, monarchs do not themselves prophesy. The connection with prophecy remains very, very close, and it's exemplified in several ways. 